you listening to Thinking Out Loud at WUML Lowell. Today is Tuesday. It's uh, December 27th, very near the end of the year. We have two very special guests with us today, Ed Alcantara from the Merrimack Valley Housing Partnership and Ken Barad from the Coalition for a Better Acre. Joining us a little later, and we hope not too much later, is going to be Grace Ross, who you know we normally have her on at this time, and we've been talking about foreclosure for a long, long time. But... Um, to go through the whole process, we're going to make a uh, an instructional video basically out of this out of this program today that um, Dan Toomey is going to put on LTC so you can view it and hopefully learn get some tips and information about how you avoid foreclosure and one of the best ways is to start out on the right foot. What would that be, Ed? Thank you for having us, David. Uh, one of the first steps, and I always say with anything in life, it's good to be educated before you venture into anything, whether it's a business or owning a home, and it's been proven that home buyer education is really really a strong uh, you know part of the process if you have education you're less likely to default the numbers are there uh, with MHP is a great first-time home buyer program mass housing and they all require home buyer education to get a lower interest rate so that they have a better mortgage product and so I always say let's start with the education so people understand what they're getting into they may not even be ready, and they take the class, and they come up to me afterwards, or Jim, the director, and say, you know, I'm glad I took this. I realize I'm not ready right now. And that's a success story, because if they had not been educated, they might have gone to, uh, you know, an open house. They might have said, oh, I like this house. Let's make an offer. They qualify for a mortgage that might be uh, a little bit too much for them. And then all of a sudden, they're making the first six, seven payments, and they start running into trouble. So... People understand when they're not ready that they need to get ready. They need to be prepared. There's a lot more than just, well, I'm paying 1000 for rent. I'm ready to pay 1500 for a mortgage. So that's the core. And, and what we do is we try to have people take the course, and then we try to sit down with them individually and look at their personal expenses, their budget. Where are they financially? I mean, can you save money? That's the bottom line. When I sit with folks and they bring in three months bank statements and they've got $10, $30, $50 left over at the end of the month and I'm looking at a three month statement, I'm looking at the balance after each month and I say, well listen, you're paying a thousand for rent, you've got $10 here, $30 last month, you know, where's the money going? Let's figure that out. And then you see how it's not going to work if you get into a more expensive mortgage. You're paying a thousand for rent, you can afford that, but you're scraping by, so you're not ready. And you brought up a good point. I want to play Napoleon's corporal here. I, I've met um, a lot of people, including myself, who bought a home a long time ago, back in 1970, and didn't have a clue as to what I was doing, and I was just plain lucky. A lot of people out there, maybe you can verify this, have, they've maybe bought a home or something in the past, or they've been close to it, so they think they know all about it. What's the fallacy behind that? What are, the, what are some of the you know, pitfalls as they go along that they don't know about, that they think they know about, that they don't have to know about in order to go forward with this? Well, there is no home buyer requirement technically unless you want a special mortgage product. So you can run to a real estate office and say, geez, you know, I want to buy a house, which is what a lot of people do. Instead of getting the education and getting pre-approved, they go see somebody. And a real estate agent, uh, you know, good people out there in the business you know, they may refer them to a home buyer education to say, hey, listen, why don't you do this first, then come back and see me. But there are people out there that don't do that, and they say, well, let's get you pre-approved. I'm going to send you over to Bob. Bob's a mortgage guy in the business. And Bob says, hey, you're approved. You've got an FHA loan. And the people are happy. They say, wow, I got approved. Somebody actually likes me. They gave me a mortgage. They don't do any research to find out if they could have done better financially. And they're off and running, looking at houses, They've got a brother who's a contractor. They don't get a home inspection. Oh, my brother can look at the house. There's a lot of things. And I've run into people who say, I bought my first house, and you know what? All I did was sign papers. I don't even know what happened, but I moved in, and I bought my house. And now they're learning from other people, you know, and they'll say, hey, I got lucky. And, and I've seen the horror stories where people say, you know, I really wish I had some guidance because this is the worst thing I've ever done. And we don't want people to have that experience. I mean, let's face it, buying a home is probably the biggest expenditure that anyone ever makes, right? Absolutely. And it's, 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 it can be a dream or it can be a nightmare. Uh, I've seen all kinds of things out there where people waive their home inspections because, you know, the home seller is more apt to take their offer. And now they've got a house that's got all kinds of major problems and it's too late. They've bought it and, 
yeah, you wanted them to accept your house, but not under those circumstances. I mean, your offer. You want them to accept the offer, but you don't want to forsake a home inspection ever. We're talking to uh, Ed Alcantara from the Memac Valley Housing Partnership. They run a series of uh, home buyer education courses called Project Genesis. Tell us a little bit about some of the experts that you call upon to come in on these classes and instruct people, like inspectors and who else yeah. are some of the people who come in as a part of this? Yeah, we've got uh, various professionals from all fields. We have, uh, there's always a rotation of the speakers. So we have like four home inspectors and we rotate them. Uh, we have many attorneys, many lenders, many real estate agents. And so what happens is people come in and my Jim and myself, Jim Wilde, the director, uh, does the overview of the entire process on night one, and that's very comprehensive in all the steps. And I always say that sets the groundwork for everything else that follows. And even if you just came to night one, you're so prepared as far as what's supposed to happen along the way that even if you didn't come to the other classes, well, we want people to finish the program and take all four, but that sets the tone, and, and you learn so much just from the first class. In the second class, we've got a banker that is selected on a rotation. They talk about the mortgage process today, not what it was like six months ago or two years ago when your brother-in-law got a loan with no income verification. The mortgage industry has completely changed. Uh, then we have, I speak about special mortgage products for first-time buyers. Night three, we have an attorney and a home inspector, and the attorney will talk about the closing and, and all the steps in making an offer and, and the legalities the purchase sale agreement, and then night four, we wrap it up with uh, budgeting. Uh, we discuss credit also on night one. We, we go into budgeting, the real estate presentation, uh, energy saving, uh, successful home ownership. So it's comprehensive, but what I do want to say is that there's post-purchase education after people buy a house, but there's no enforcement to make people do that. And a lot of people do it because it's required. I know with the Mass Housing Partnership MHP1 program, they require it. But that program helps reinforce a lot of the stuff they got in the post, the pre-purchase workshops. And they get discounts on insurance and other types of savings uh, as well when they complete a post-purchase. So it's well worth it. It helps them become a much more successful homeowner, uh, be able to manage their property better. And this is just, you know, the, the setting the table. If somebody's gonna buy a two family, they, they should be taking a landlord training course. Now you're in business. And whether you have a two family or you own 200 units, you go to housing court, you're the same guy as the guy with 200 units. There's no, Jesus, you know, I'm new with this. Can you give me a break, help me out? You have to know the laws, you're in business. So we help people understand whether or not they want to buy a multifamily after they take the course. And some certificates, are these certificates are required by certain loan programs. Uh, such as Mass Housing Partnership and, and Mass Housing, but even if you weren't going to get a, uh, a special loan that required the training or the education, I would think that if you're going to go into business, you want to know everything about it. So Now, the uh, before we went on air, Ed, you were telling us that uh, the, the federal agency, FHA, Federal Housing Authority, mm -hmm. and they do not require any education on the part of consumers when they embark on one of these uh, well, purchases? There are cases where they have to reestablish after bankruptcy or if they've, uh, they're have they refinancing, they may require it. Uh, but I know initially when somebody's buying their first house, the lender or the, the government does not require that anybody get an FHA loan get home buyer education, which I think is really uh, unfortunate because a lot of the folks that are getting FHA loans, uh, you know, are prime candidates for, for you know, getting the education to make them better homeowners. We had a lot of foreclosures with FHA loans. They were riskier. They, they lent money to people with lower credit scores. Uh, the credit standards were not as high. And, and, you know, the one thing is that they allow higher debt ratios, which is good if you're a, and I want to put quotes around good because nothing like that is always good, but if you're a student uh, who graduated and you've got a high paying career job, well, these student loans can hurt you because now it makes it more difficult to get a loan. A lot of times FHA may be the way to get in because, you know, they allow a higher debt ratio. So if you've got student loans, there's not many products that will let you go on and move on with your life and buy a home. And we're all going to be facing a student loan crisis at some point, and, and people are talking about it now. But, you know, that's a different story than somebody who's making 35000 a year 
low to moderate income family who's getting into 50 percent debt, that's a whole different world because you know they're they don't have the cushion. If somebody's making 75 or 80 thousand a year and they're at 50 percent debt, they can with, withstand you know a bump in the road. Well, I, I, to your point, Ed, I think the education is is crucial, uh, and the FHA does have the reentry program for folks that have been recently foreclosed on within two years that can kind of come back in. But you're right, there is a big gap in terms of of uh, are those folks fully prepared to be successful moving forward. Uh, I mean, w at the Center uh, for the Home Preservation Center under the Coalition for a Better Acre, we've seen that pattern replayed over the last seven years since the crisis uh, began in 2006, 2007. And I know when we've worked together on the Total foreclosure state. task force uh, that we've come across that uh, many times. Uh, and I echo the, the, your sentiments about post-purchase. I think the reaffirming of the post-purchase education just helps keep everyone on track. Um, you know, it's, it's, it is something that's probably I, I the least utilized, the most state vital state thing. Right. The one thing, too, is, Ken, we're on a foreclosure task force together. We cover a lot of topics. But, um, you know, you're working with people who basically have run into problems uh, with home ownership, and you're trying to get them back on track, and that's not very easy. Uh, and we've had these discussions that a lot of times it's hard to change behaviors, and people are used to a certain lifestyle. They can't pay the mortgage. They're going into foreclosure, but they don't want to readjust their budgets. It's just almost like there's a disconnect uh, with that. And, and you must see a lot of cases where I would think there's a common thread that you see in, in the cases where people can't turn it around versus the ones that have been able to turn it around. Well, I, you know, you're right. I think there's, there's several uh, typical things, although each case is unique unto itself. Uh, you see folks that come in with a budget uh, that uh, may, over time, no longer allow for a housing expense. So they don't have room in their budget to pay a rent, to pay a mortgage, to s let alone pay taxes or insurance. Um, those situations are already predestined to fail because you can't uh, get something from nothing. It's difficult to save your way into a mortgage payment if you've created a budget because of your lifestyle that doesn't allow for it. There's lots of probably very good reasons why that can happen over time. Um, you have now we're facing in this stage of the crisis, as everyone says, the foreclosure crisis is past us. I think we're still there's still quite a few properties out there that people are facing issues. So we're seeing uh, folks who are having longer term delinquencies that are now looking for some help because banks are becoming more comfortable and more aggressive uh, with their position in terms of how they can uh, get these properties performing again. Uh, so they're coming in and their situations are just like we said. They, they've created a, a budget that probably doesn't have room, so that requires a, a counselor to sit down, really rework things, figure out is this the right time and the best place for them to be? Should they move on? How can we make this rework and save this home, make the uh, mortgage performing again? Yeah, I've always said if, you are, if you're going to lose your house to foreclose, you might as well try to save it because you're going to have to go pay rent somewhere else. Why not work it out? Um, and it just seems like people in the past would stick their head in the sand, denial or whatever, and, you know, the day comes where there's an auction and, and you know, there's not much they can do. And I always tell people, be proactive. And you've got the three Ds, death, disability, and divorce. We don't know if and when those things occur, but that's life. And people are not prepared. I've seen people who bought a house and lost their job the week after the closing. I mean, that's that's devastating. But it all goes back to having a backup plan, having you know some type of situation where you know you've got something to fall back on. And and I want to reiterate your point. You can't save yourself into a mortgage. And I tell people, you can't learn to budget and save when you buy a house. You gotta practice this before you buy the house. You have to ha be kind of an expert in your own household budget. You have to know how you're gonna manage your money. You know, you have to learn how to save. You can't just say, okay, I'm ready, when you haven't been proving yourself. And I always tell everybody I sit with, the underwriter's gonna look at these bank statements just like I am, and they're gonna say, there's no way this person can afford this house. And the banks, because of the Frank Dodd Act, have an obligation to make sure that the mortgages that there's an ability to repay, that the, the home buyer can repay that mortgage. And so, you know, they're looking at everything closer, but I'm concerned about the market where it's at. These properties have gone up in price. 
we're almost at 2006 prices. I mean, there's, they've always, all the experts have said, though, where there's enough checks and balances, we won't ever go through that huge foreclosure crisis that we had. Well, we may not go to that extent, but I think that, you know, we're in a precarious situation where the property values are so high. People have been priced out because the properties have gone up, which it's the market. We can't control that. But also the interest rates have started rising. And so people that could buy six months ago or three months ago just can't buy right now. But my concern is beyond that. My concern is, you know, what happens when people are paying top dollar? They're overstretching themselves to get into the house because, you know, they don't want to pay rent anymore. The rents have gone up. Um, you know, if they're not prepared financially for any slip up, you know, they could end up coming to see you. Well, I, true. You know, and I think that's certainly uh, something that needs to be uh, watched and kept an eye on. But I think there's even a, a greater uh, number out there of folks who are still, even in our local area, the Merrimack Valley, that are underwater still. Property values have gone up, but we there are still a significant number of homes that are underwater. Those folks are in their home and may or may not be current. Uh, so they're, they're either trapped there be, and trying to stay current. Keep, they can't sell their way out of it, uh, or they're looking for an alternative. And some of the problems with that typically would have been a modification option to try to get to a more uh, affordable po payment. Now, when a house goes underwater, as we say, and that is the, the what they what they the, the, what is it? The value of the, the mortgage is more than the value of the home. Exactly. Yeah. And how do they get put there? Does the bank put them there by increasing the value of, of the the house arbitrarily? No. How does that happen? Well, you want to speak to us? Yeah. Well, okay. I mean, market the, the value of the home is a function of the market. Okay. So I mean, obviously, it's a supply and demand. It's a location, as we say in real estate, that uh, drives those prices. A, a home in Malden is going to be uh, much more uh, much more expensive than a than a home up here, more than, right. more often than not. Right. Uh, so it's usually their market factors. They're not. Uh, so it's a. Uh, but what we've seen now is a uh, low inventory of starter uh, homes, yep. uh, which are often the folks coming out of the pre-purchase programs. And so, of course, with less inventory, more pe qualified people, which you guys have done great qualifying folks at, over at Merrimack Valley Housing, uh, the, uh, but there's not enough homes for them to buy. So, of course, that drives those prices up. Uh, but what some folks, when they bought at the peak, which was 2006, 2006, yeah. 2000, the, some, some, of those price, some of those values have not come back to 2006. Many have. Many but, have, yeah. But the Merrimack Valley Housing Report still shows uh, yep. many homes that uh, are still struggling in that and area. And we're looking at geographical areas because Essex County is very expensive, and a lot of those houses have come back more so in that county mm -hmm. than Middlesex. I mean, or at least northern Middlesex. But what I uh, worry about is that the houses that are underwater, the banks may be reluctant. But as prices keep going up, the banks may be more aggressive in foreclosing because now they know they're not going to lose as much money. You know, if I owe hundred thousand, if the, the house is a hundred thousand dollars in a hole, they might not be as aggressive. But if it's only ten thousand now, the bank's going to be like, "Hey, we're going to go after this house," and the homeowner is going to face the reality that unless they can get something worked out, they're going to be on a street. So rising values are going to have an impact on those houses that are underwater. It might. You know, we might have accelerated foreclosures in the future because of that. By the way, if you're just tuning in, we have in the studio with us Ken Barad. He's from the Coalition for a Better Acre. He's the Director of Home Preservation over there, and Ed Alcantara, who's from the Merrimack Valley Housing Partnership. And uh, Ed does a lot of work with uh, Project Genesis, which is the Home Buying Training, training Seminar. When uh, it's not, it doesn't seem to me that it's a to the bank's advantage to put someone underwater or to uh, foreclose on them, is it? So why do they do it? I mean, all of a sudden you, you, you got a home, there's nobody there, you're not getting anything. Yeah. I okay. mean, some money is better than no money for the bank, isn't it? Well, just to be clear, the bank isn't putting it underwater. Okay. It's the market value that puts oh, it underwater. Okay. So the, the mortgage was higher than what the sales price could be at any given time. That's what puts a property underwater. Uh, but the foreclosure piece is all about a performing loan. I mean, that's all banks have done forever, right? It's and they've got years. investors they have yeah. to answer to. It's not like, well, I mean, it doesn't make sense to let a house sit empty for two or three years. Yeah. But there was, we've discussed this in the foreclosure task force, that they have to do things a certain way so that, you know, uh, the books, they don't have a rush of, of, of losses. And so the, the, from what we understand, you know, 
there's a amount of properties that they put out at a given time and they have a methodical way of doing this so that the investors I guess are happy and the numbers look good when you say the when you say that it's coming back you said Essex County they're coming back coming back does that mean the house prices are going down or the house prices are going up oh they're going up going up oh yeah they're going up which is really good fast. if you're in a good position because yeah. that's raising net worth but it depends on uh, what end of the spectrum you're on I mean if we take Lowell I, I we help a lot of folks with down payment assistance with the city and uh, a year and a half ago you know somebody could buy a single family real nice area real nice shape mm -hmm. uh, you know for at a much more affordable price even a two family you could get for like two two fifty two sixty. Uh, a two-family today, you're lucky to get a decent one in real good shape for 320 330 You know, and you got to really work at finding them. There's not a lot of them around, and mm -hmm. there's tons of people that want them. So, you know, this is where timing comes in, and I've always told people, now is a great time to buy, 2010, 2011. You know, if we knew now what we knew then, we'd be buying then. I told everybody, buy now. Nobody mm -hmm. wants to buy property because they're scared with the economy, yep. all the uncertainty. The government was providing that uh, they, they were doing the assistance program where you'd buy a house and they'd provide you with $8,000. And then the year before that, in 2009, there was a 70, 8000 the first year, then it was 7500 but that had to be repaid. But everybody, we saw, we saw the swarm come in with that incentive, and then they took it away. And, you know... That was a good time in the market because the property was so cheap and it was like, you know, buy now. Mm -hmm. I was screaming at the top of the lungs, buy now, buy now. But it's a herd mentality. People are afraid. Really? As, as an overall um, question, what percentage of, let's say a couple is making combined incomes, say $100,000 a year, what percentage or portion of that should they be able to afford a house? And does it's 30% of their gross income? Is that what well the numbers we use yeah, i mean 33 30, 38 yeah. there's there's two ratios the front ratio everybody does good on because that's the front the What's front the, the front means what is my income relative to the mortgage payment okay so you know if you're at 33 percent that's great and now don't forget 33 percent of gross income is what the banks calculate they use gross income and what the where people get stuck is on the second ratio where they've got the car payment the wife's got a car payment then they've got uh, credit cards and, and all that debt. They only allow 5% between the front and the back ratio. Let's say he's 38. This is a standard, but there are programs that will let you exceed those numbers, and that's where people have to be careful. I always say, why don't you get your debt in order, straighten out your financial life, and then when you move forward, you'll be much more successful. But everybody wants the house. they got to have the house. They need to live somewhere and... We'll deal with the finances later. We'll we'll sort this out. We'll budget. We'll save. We're going to do a good job saving. Well, just watch us. And my attitude is no. I'm watching you now, and you're not doing it. Right. So in other words, when you're, you're looking at a couple that is about to make a home purchase, you're also looking at their savings. And that's obviously for a rainy day or something catastrophic happens. They can carry the mortgage for a few months, and they don't have to right. be thrown out of the house. Well, that's the hope. But a lot of times people don't have liquid cash assets they have money in a 401k uh, so at least they've got something to fall back on if there's a hardship but I, I see a lot of people that uh, don't have maybe more than the bank may require one month reserve or two depending on the mortgage product that doesn't seem like very much no it doesn't but they get in to their property and they may have some other money to fall back on but there are cases where you know people really don't have the money they get in and then it's kind of like okay let's we got to work hard now to, to build up that nest egg. We always tell people you should have at least six months, which I know probably 90% of the population doesn't have six months reserves in the bank. But I would say to people, at least try to get three, get a second job for six months. You know, we got to make tough decisions, but people S don't. Six months doesn't seem like very much, No, yeah. given the job market. Ken, what do you have to say well, about that? You know, the, the reserves are, are important, yeah. you know, and to have reserves yeah. for those mortgage payments. But I think what where a lot of the failure occurs is the fact that as new homeowners, many people don't realize that it costs so much more than the mortgage. It's not, that's, it's, it's such a shock to a budget, and that's where pre-purchase is so important and why, personally, I think post-purchase beyond that as a reminder because your budget changes. People do a theoretical budget in pre-purchase, pre 
and and then somehow all of a sudden get very excited, get into the home, buy a whole house full of New furniture, furniture. Exactly. and everything else under the sun, and at twenty percent interest, the, the yeah. budget is no longer theoretical; it's practical, and it does not trans, uh, transfer necessarily dollar for dollar. So, it's it's a real really important that people refocus after that initial rush of excitement that they, they, so they can stay on track. What are some, Ken, what do you see as some of the unexpected costs that come along after someone gets into a house? Uh, you, you need know, a new roof? Well, hopefully not if you had a home inspection. Exactly. Well, okay. <laughs> All right. You know, if, you, if, that, if that's there, they should hopefully have found that out. Uh, but it could be anything. Uh, you, you, uh, depends how big the house is. You've got a six-room house and you want to fill up all rooms with furniture. If you're coming from a three-bedroom apartment, that's an added expenditure that many people don't plan for. And they think, oh, well, we'll just do it going ahead. But as Ed said, 20% or whatever, even if you're going to get interest-free for a year, it, that bill is going to come due at that, some point. And that, they're lucky if that's all they've got. But yeah. if they buy a house that needs work, because they might say, you know what, this bathroom's lousy. It's like from the 50s. Let's do the bathroom over. Now we got you know, internal costs of fixing a place and, you know, making it nice, putting the hardwood floors or whatever. I mean, people need the budget for everything they're doing, not just do it all at once overnight. Now, uh, General, we have about uh, two minutes to wrap this up. But, uh, and one of the things that you do, and I've seen you do it, I've sat in on one of these, you sit down, at, it's one of the graduates from Project Genesis, you sit down with them and actually go through a detailed analysis. W what do you call that assessment that you it's do? It's a home readiness assessment. It's two hours, and it's very intensive and it's specifically geared to them, and we talk about uh, behavior, um, you know, spending habits, lifestyle, everything, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, people really uh, are open and honest, and, and I say, look, at I don't judge anybody. Everything's confidential, but we're here about you, and we want to make things work better for you. The one thing I did want to mention is that as a tenant, if there's a property that's been foreclosed, uh, tenants have rights, even if they don't have a lease, uh, there's situations where the bank may give them cash for keys to move out they may give up some of the legal rights but that's something that could work for them um, I did want to mention that there is a number uh, that people should keep in mind if they are experiencing foreclosure and they're uh, renting and we've got a number through the uh, consumer uh, line hotline and it's 888-283-3757 that's the uh, Consumer Hotline for the Division of Consumer Affairs. People that are uh, also running into foreclosure issues as a tenant can, uh, you know, talk to the uh, any of the neighborhood legal aid services and they can direct them to the appropriate channels. Well, as, as we wrap up, Ed, could you repeat that number one more time, loud and clear, for all our listeners who may not have caught it the first time? Sure. That's the uh, Consumer Hotline through uh, the state of Massachusetts, and the number is 888 283-3757. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for coming in. It's been a great program, and uh, we'd like to have you back sometime in the future. There's a lot, a lot to talk about here. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Dick. All right, thank you. Walking the streets of a place I call home Along the Merrimack River wind Making me shiver Sending a chill up my spine But I feel fine All in the same boat Sisters and brothers Future generations Setting sail from overseas Destination low The city of dreams